Good afternoon and welcome to Sunday Sessions with Courtney Pollock. Uh, for those that are just tuning in, Courtney Pollock uh, is the original tie-dye artist for The Grateful Dead. You can see a beautiful piece behind us here. He's also wearing one of his own custom shirts as well. Mm -hmm. um, Courtney uh, was with The Grateful Dead from the 70s to late 80s, but there's so much more that is about Courtney. And we're starting out in his early years as a young boy and we'll be sharing stories of his life when he was in America as well as his adventures in Canada as well and uh, so I'm gonna let you take it away Courtney. Thank you Heidi. You're welcome. Go ahead. Hello. Um, just one point of uh, technical point. Yes. Um, Heidi graciously said, you know, the original tie dye after Great for Dead. However, Rosie McGee, who was partnered up with Phil Lesh back in the 60s, uh, she actually started doing uh, tie dye cabinet fronts um, back in uh, 67, 68, 69. Um, uh, not full stage sets necessarily, but um, um, when I came along, there were still a lot of her work on, on stage. And I had the good opportunity to, um, I was commissioned to do a full stage uh, set um, as, a, as an overall uh, design. Um, so uh, I wasn't really the, the first, but I was certainly the first person to do a full stage design set as a commission. Um, but uh, just to, um, you know, and Rosie, of course, she's always been the most wonderful and gracious person. And when I came along with my stuff, uh, and in her own words, she said it was almost a relief that I didn't have that responsibility anymore because it's so much work. Um, and uh, so anyway, that's just to set that record more straight. <clears throat> and um, so, in those uh, early days of, uh, of a grand, grand adventure in the life of uh, the <laughs> little boy Courtney, <laughs> um, um, I was, we were brought up uh, Catholics. And of course, you know, the, um, England's not a Catholic country. It's, a, it's a, what they call a Protestant country. And um, so uh, the Catholic schools were not subsidized by the state, by the, by the crown. They were uh, supported by the Catholic church. And typically, most of the Catholics in England were Irish um, or some vestiges of Celtic people that, you know, became Catholic. And then, you know, the ones that were slower to change, maybe, I don't know. But um, uh, even though my dad wasn't a particularly um, a good ca practicing Catholic, he insisted that we were brought up in that faith. Uh, just to let you know, um, I found it absolutely barbaric and brutal. And uh, by the age of mm, 11, 12, I had completely divorced myself from the church. But meantime, up until that time, um, I was sent to a Catholic school. And, uh, and then when the 11 plus comes around, which I don't know if you know what that is, but in England, it, back in those times anyway, um, the 11 plus was a a, a, a test to see which school, as a senior, you would uh, go to, a grammar school, a technical school, or a secondary modern. Um, in my case, I was kept at the uh, St. Michael's Catholic School and went into the senior school um, because it was the only Catholic school around. And uh, even though in, in the junior school, out of a class of 40 to 50 uh, pupils, uh, boys and girls in the junior schools. Um, I was always in the uh, top three in the class. I mean, top three in any subject. So on aggregate, I was just, you know, uh, everything was so easy for me. I didn't find the lessons difficult at all, particularly if I liked the uh, lessons, the, the, the uh, teachers. But when I went to the senior school, well, that was another story. It was... Um, it was all Irish boys. Uh, they're all scrappers. Um, they're all running riot through the school. 
and the school was having real difficulties because the students were running the, the, the school. They were just threatening the teachers. So the headmaster of the junior school, who was headmaster overall for the, both the senior and the junior school, he um, brought in the services of a, uh, what you call a ringer. Uh, this guy was a teacher from Ireland who was also the light heavyweight champion of Ireland boxing. This guy comes in. Jack Dara, and uh, uh, he's brought in to straighten out the school. And uh, the first thing that happens, um, the headmaster and Jack Dara walking through the only corridor there was, you know, separating the uh, staff from the classrooms. And there's boys running through these, you know, so-called, uh, uh, you know, uh, or official area, and. They were just going to barge right by, the, by uh, the headmaster and, and the headmaster of the senior school now, Jack Dara, and just because they're used to just running right through the school. And as they came around, then these are big boys. Bam, bam! Jack Dara just floored these guys, broke one guy's jaw, broke the other guy's collarbone, one punch each. They both went to hospital, and word got around. And any time anybody was out of bounds, bam, bam, this guy just put, put him down. Wow. And, uh, and then uh, I, um, my first day at the senior school, and there's, you know, I'm out in the playground, we're all running and chasing and shouting and screaming and, you know, I'm all excited and suddenly I realize I'm the only one that's shouting and screaming and everybody's like, totally frozen solid and all looking at me. I was like, what's going on here? And uh, you, new boy, you come out after uh, assembly. You step forward, get your punishment. And I'm like, what, what did I do? He, said, uh, <laughs> he was like, running and shouting after the whistle blows. And I'm like, I didn't hear any whistle, you know. And that's another one, you do not answer back. <laughs> so anyway, the assembly happened, you know, it's God and the Queen and all that rubbish stuff. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and uh, new boy, step forward. So I stepped forward and uh, <laughs> he said, go to the cupboard and f select a cane. Yes, he's cupboard. So I walk over to this cupboard and I open the cupboard and it's full of canes. There's Every cane you could imagine. There's great big ones like staffs. There's like the little whippy ones. Um, there's, but there's, you know, all of these lethal looking, nasty looking things. And uh, there's like a whole cupboard of canes. I was like, this guy for real? So I go, oh, I gotta lighten this up a bit. So I get the biggest one I can find. I go, you know, and mm -mm. I look in, I go, oh, okay. Oh, there's a little whippy one. I pull out this little. <laughs> I look in the cupboard and I go, oh, God. I know exactly which is the worst cane in there, and that's the one he wants. So I pull it out. And he said, ah, now that's the boy that knows his canes. <laughs> and I, he's like, grabs his thing from me. He's like, whoo, whoo, whoo. get that hand up. Get that thumb down. We don't want to break the thumb now, do we? And I'm like, break the thumb? <laughs> what the? <laughs> and uh, get that thumb down. So I'm like, and he's like, you know, getting the cane, you know, lining it up. And he's like, you know, doing these false starts and getting me to <laughs> flinch. And he's like, finally, he's like, <laughs> brings it down. Ka-ching, nice. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> so, <laughs> it just misses the end of my finger. I'm like. <laughs> and he said, uh, not yet. And he's just, you know, he's just playing with me. You know, he's like, this just fiendishly. And he finally gets it up there. And he's like. <laughs> brings his cane down, bam! And he's like, oh! I'm like, I felt like the ends of my fingers were cut off. Oh. And I'm, I'm looking at my hand, they're just ballooning in 
turning purple and I'm like, <laughs> and it hurt from my toes up through the top of my head. Get that hand back up, get that thumb down. Woof, another one. And I'm like, oh my God, you know? <clears throat> and um, he's, other hand. Same thing on the other hand. And, uh, and now I'm like, ah, I am in so much pain. I couldn't do anything. I couldn't do anything with my hands. And you have to go to your desk. And I was appointed a desk. And you have, back in those days, we had, well, in that school, you had a piece, of, a stick with a nib on the end and an inkwell. That was our pens. And I'm like, I couldn't pick it up. I couldn't hold it. I'm like, write your name and address. Da, 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 you know, and I'm like, <laughs> this ink splashing everywhere. And I'm like, <laughs> and he comes up and he's got a bunch of keys. And he's like, he said, what is this mess? And he's punching me in the head with a bunch of keys. And I'm like, ah. <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> anyway, uh, all this punishment took place in front of the whole school. And, um, and he says, you'll be cane twice a day for a year. I'm like, what? <laughs> I mean, seriously, twice a day for a year. Well, I was. At least it started out that way. I started out getting to cane twice a day, you know, two stripes on each hand every day, twice a day. Once in the morning and once after uh, lunch. And, uh, and you know, I, I didn't make a squeak. I just took the punishment. I never talked about it at home. It wasn't going to do any, oh, you're exaggerating, Courtney. No, 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 it's, you know, a little bit, you know, just make a man of you. <laughs> I was like, anyway, um, then the weather started to turn. Instead of having soccer out in the, uh, out in the playground, uh, well, it's really raining, so we're all inside. They push the petitions back. The whole school is just really three rooms divided by, you know, two petition walls, and they push petitions back. The whole school's there. They said, we're going to have boxing. <clears throat> and uh, so he um, sets up a ring of boys that are all just in a square, and, you know, that's, they're the ring, so anybody gets push not back into the ropes they get pushed back out into the ring and um and uh he said well start with the smallest boys you know and work up in age you know um anyway he uh he sets me up with this uh kid brian ross he he had two brothers that were both olympic uh boxing competitors so brian ross was the same age and weight as me but he he knew some stuff and um, so we're out, we're out in the ring and I'm like, you know, he's all, you know, and I'm like, mm -hmm, trying to figure this out, you know, and he, he comes in and, and pretty soon I got it kind of sorted out and I'm starting to score and pretty soon I'm, I'm beating this guy. And uh, uh, so <clears throat> Jack Jarrett says, enough, stop, stop boxing. And then he gets an older boy that's just a little heavier puts him in the ring with me and uh, box on. And uh, so I'm like figuring this guy, and this guy's a hammer, you know, he just really, uh, he's, he's got experience, he's a bit older, he's a bit heavier, and, uh, and uh, he's gonna hurt me, you know. But um, I managed to hold him off and fend him off and started to really, uh, you know, give as much as I was getting. And uh, at the end of that, Jack Dara started to take a whole interest in me and started to actually um, uh, tutor me in boxing. He saw some potential there. And his whole attitude towards me as being the only Englishman in the Irish school, essentially, and uh, being this little Lord Fauntleroy in my little gray suit with my nice little tie and badge on and everything like that. <laughs> and. Uh, he hated me on sight, and now he's like starting to accept me. And um, uh, about three months into the s school and the caning, <laughs> uh, <laughs> what a great sound! It's an awesome sound. <laughs> um, he uh, 
he calls the uh, you know a general assembly, and uh, he says. Uh, instead of instead of the punishment, because uh, he'd do the punishment every day and and noon uh, in front of the whole school, because it was an intimidation uh, thing, you know, a spectacle, you know, nobody wanted to get punished like that ever, especially not for a year, and um, uh, so I was it, you know, I was the uh, fall guy for that, and uh, so you know he's now he's like um, calls general assembly. This boy has shown great courage in the ring, and uh, and now I'm looking for. I'm going to let him off the rest of the year's caning, and now I'm looking for another person, another new, uh, another culp another suspect, another victim. <laughs> you know, and I was like, ah, I'm ready. Yeah. You know. Meanwhile, my hands are just callous. They're just covered in calluses. You know, from the canings. I mean, my son did get broke. It was fractured. It's, it still hurts to, to this day. But um, anyway, you know, we went on to uh, uh, do um, boxing exhibitions, and um, I could actually. Are we out of time for that? Well, I can continue. This, this is this is I think good. We should just keep going. <laughs> okay, so um, one of the. Now, we were a really small school. There was only 64, 65 boys in the whole senior school. Uh, by, by now, I'm uh, 12, and um, I have been made uh, captain of the boxing club because I'm district champion, and then I was uh, the county champion. And now we're um, uh, moving up in, in age and weight, and I'm uh, going into the uh, England uh, championships. And... Uh, we, there were schools uh, in town that were several hundred boys, and um, and we just a tiny little school uh, of sixty five, and uh, we were better than all of them because they were all kind of fighters, right? And anyway, um, but there was one group, this one school, and it wasn't really a school per se. It was a big old sailing ship called the Arethusa, big three masted. Uh, sailing ship of, of the old style, and uh, it was it was manned by um, uh, orphans and wayward boys that were all under uh, the uh, rulership, if you like, of the captain of the ship, who was training them, uh, teaching them the ropes, literally, you know, in the old school of sailing the great vessels of yes of yore, you know, yesteryear. And um, and they were a tough bunch, and they were our b biggest competition in the boxing arena. Uh, was the Arethusa boys, and they were probably less boys on that ship than they were in our school, but they were all of you know a similar age bracket between eleven and fifteen. And uh, I so wanted to be one of the Arethusa boys. I just like I could leave home. I could get on this sailing boat and just be away from it all and just um, have these grand adventures and learn to sail. And uh, it seemed like a great brotherhood, you know, that uh, I so wanted to be a part of the Arethusa boys. But uh, they were our major competition. And in the end, we ended up uh, uh, winning each year against them, but just by a little. They were our toughest competition by far. But um, uh, Jack Dara kind of took me under his wing, and uh, w as we travelled in England to the, as we moved through the um, different competitions towards the um, England Championships, uh, it would be he and his girlfriend, this lovely looking girl, and uh, a me travelling around in England <laughs> to these boxing meets. And it was quite the, uh, first of all, it was an adventure for me to see other parts of England and to come up against uh, um, uh, in-town politics, of course, you know, where regardless of how far, well you fought, um, if you went to the cards, uh, then you might get the decision against you, if you, even if you clearly beat the person. So you can't let it go to the cards. So um, 
So you've either got to knock them out or you've got to get a technical knockout or <clears throat> essentially create a bleed that's going to um, distress, you know, may maybe uh, cause them not to be able to see right or, you know, it, that essentially would be a technical knockout as well. So I learned uh, these little tricks from Jack Dara uh, to, as you make, uh, as you, as you, as you hit, you twist the fist right on the, and, and you pick an area where, where they're vulnerable. You can see a little pink where it's, you've gotten them a few times and you go, okay, that, that's an opening. This is where I'm gonna work on. And you know, I work on that, twist that fist, twist that and get, you know, pretty soon you got the eyebrow split and now it's the blood starting to pour into the eye. And uh, you know, or, or the nose, you know, it's like. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and it sounds brutal, but it's just a sport, right? <laughs> so, um, so I, you know, rather than have, have them go to the cards, I would, uh, and I couldn't knock them out because, you know, when you don't weigh a lot, it's really hard to get somebody knocked out unless you just knock them down and they don't want to get up again, which happened quite a lot. And, uh, <laughs> but, um, so there was all these things. So I, I got through to the England ch championships and um, um, I was up against this kid and he was a good fighter. I'd never... I'd never come up against somebody that was as good as him. He was probably as good as I am, I was. And um, we fought, we battled it out, and, uh, and in, in, in his own hometown, he got the decision. And that was my first uh, uh, trip to the uh, championships, which was still a good showing, but you know, if it'd be my town, I'd have won. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, and during this time, I, uh, um, I had started in a, a gymnastics club that was outside of school, and the guy that ran the uh, the club he was um, he was an agent for Air France, and uh, he he uh, was interested in young people's culture, and the the uh, gymnastics club was um, uh, a, a wonderful uh, uh, extracurricular event where you're learning skills and poise and balance and strength and all of this stuff. And um, he had this friends in, uh, in uh, Bordeaux in, in Northern France. <clears throat> and um, they wanted to do an exchange visit with their son uh, that was the same age as me at that time, which was, I was 12, 13. And um, so he arranged for me being the older boy um, to go and do an exchange with the the son of this family <clears throat> and um, I went the first year and the following year that young man came to us in England uh, so I get shipped off I, I'm on a plane to uh, to um, Pontrieu I mean uh, where anyway I haven't seen these people I have no idea what they look but they have photograph of me and I come out of the airport and I I mean, I mean, flew for the first time and alone. And uh, um, I remember one of the things on the plane, Air France, you know, used to have good food and all that stuff. And I remember saving this beautiful grape just for the end of my meal to have this wonderful taste in my mouth. And, um, and I, <laughs> I popped this beautiful succulent looking grape and it was like, what's that? And it was an olive. <laughs> I'd never had or seen an olive. <laughs> but um, anyway, I get picked up by this French family. Uh, they recognize me. And we go out to this long, sleek Citroën. And uh, I'm sitting in the back with uh, Jean-Philippe and his brother, um, his older brother who's 16 and uh, uh, Jean-Philippe is 13, the same age as me. And, uh, uh, and we start just flashing through these tiny little country lanes. And this Citroen is doing 120, 140, you know, it's like whipping through all this. And, and this hedge grows like in England, these narrow roads and you can't see around the corners because of these hedge groves. And he's just like, just racing. And I'm just loving it. I think, yeah, step on it. <laughs> <laughs> it was such a, a grand um, race and adventure, and I'd never been in such a sleek, fast car. 
but uh, two, three hours later, we bridge, we're out in the country, we've been driving for a long time out in the country, and we come over the top of this rise and enter down into this valley, and there's just vineyards on either side of the valley and all these little cottages and a great big mansion on the hill. And as we drive down into the valley, there's all these people standing by the side of the road waving the Union Jack, you know, the British flag. And I went, oh, who's coming? They said, it's for you. And I'm like, ah. <laughs> I was like, oh, God. Uh, and, of course, the whole t town worked for this guy. All the, all the vineyards, the factories, the houses, he owned it all. And uh, we get up to the big mansion up on the hill, and uh, uh, I, I, I'm like, oh, this is going to be great. <laughs> so um, it's getting towards dinner time, and he says, uh, and he was a German. The, his wife was an aristocratic uh, French woman, you know, that uh, he, he, she was, uh, you know, a booty prize for from, from, from the Germans invading oh France. <laughs> but, <laughs> but he, you know, he, they were doing all right. So anyway, <laughs> uh, he said, would you like to come and chew some wines with me? I said, oh yeah. And he gets his carrier. Uh, it's kind of like a milk crate carrier that we used to carry our milk uh, bottles in, but it's for wine. And we go down into under the house, into this, you know, wine cellars. And there's just like, this is like something out of Edgar Allan Poe. There's just cellar after cellar after cellar of wines and mm. barrels and old. And we're going through and it's all dusty and he'd turn a bottle a little bit here and there. You know, pull one out, you know, well, that one. And then, you know, pretty soon we had like seven bottles of wine in my case. And uh, um, go back to dinner and um, so we're all sitting around and he opens the first bottle of wine and we all have some wine. Uh, you couldn't drink the water there, the water was not potable, it would make you sick. So um, you, you know, you either drank wine or had cider. Well, they're both alcoholic. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so we're, we're all drinking our wine and the first course comes in and uh, you know, whatever it was, salad probably, and uh, everything's delicious. But we don't get the next course until that bottle of wine is finished. And then um, when everything's gone, just right on cue, cue like magic, the next course arrives, the next bottle is opened and poured, and uh, we work our way through seven courses and seven bottles of wine. And now I'm feeling pretty happy. <laughs> <laughs> it's like really <laughs> it's not like I never tasted alcohol but my dad was like well you can have all the beer and wine you want you know just never get sloppy otherwise all over you know just uh, if you can't hold your liquor you can't drink it um, but keep off the hard stuff until you're older right and <laughs> anyway so I I could uh, you know hold a little bit of liquor um, even as a kid but boy, you know, seven bottles of wine amongst uh, two adults and three children. Oh my goodness. <laughs> oh, and uh, uh, so this, every day, and lunch was five bottles of wine, dinner seven. So <clears throat> that was every day for a whole summer. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I came back home, I was snuzzled. <laughs> and, uh, so on, on the duty free, coming home, it was a great place. You know, I learned to ride horses and all kinds of stuff. And it was, they had a residence on the beach and oh, it was a wonderful uh, uh, episode for me. Um, and I buy um, uh, a duty free bottle of uh, Benedictine and brandy because I remember <clears throat> my father and his family talking about B&B &B and how good it is. And my mother didn't drink alcohol at all. So I bought B&B uh, &B for my dad, a bottle of perfume for my mother and for my sister. I don't think I got my little brother anything. <laughs> and uh, so we get back and I'm, I'm talking like pigeon English because I've been, you know, my English has been stinted, stilted by, um, you know, trying to make myself understood. Whereas I didn't really speak any French 
and the whole idea was for me to learn French and I didn't, they learned English a little bit. <laughs> but anyway, I learned a bit. But anyway, um, so we get back and, well, I think we should have a toast. Uh, everybody had a little bit of B&B. &B. Come on, uh, come on, Olivia, you can have just a taste. He said, well, okay, Max, but you know I don't drink. And he said, no, no, just a, just a taste. So we all have a sip of this B&B &B and it's, oh, it's gorgeous. Have you ever had B&B? &B? Benedictine and brandy, it's so good. <laughs> it's really good. Anyway, um, so I toddle off to bed and uh, a day or so later, you know, everything's gone back to routine. And I think, God, that B&B &B was good. And I go to the liquor cabinet and I look in there and I look at the bottle and I go, ah, oh, yeah, they, well, they've had, had a few nips. Oh, I have a little taste, nobody will notice. So I have a little taste and uh, I thought, oh, that's so good. And a few days later, same thing. I go, oh, yeah, they've had a little more. They've had a few more nips and uh, months later, the bottle's empty. And uh, my dad's in, you know, he goes to the drink cabinet and he says, well, I say, Olivia, have you been at the B&B? &B? She said, well, no, Max, you know that I don't drink. And he said, well, it's a funny thing, the bottle's empty. I'm like, <laughs> I drank the whole thing. <laughs> oh my goodness. It was, um, yeah, and I went, uh, 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 and I told him the story. And my mother was absolutely mortified, and my oh. dad was trying his hardest not to laugh. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, enough of that. Okay. Well, let's uh, call it call it a uh, time for now. I call that a, a, a take. A take, yes. <laughs> thank you. Definitely, and uh, thank you for that. It, that was very entertaining, ah. and I look forward to hearing more. Uh huh. And Cheers. I hope you guys do too. Not B and B. No. <laughs> Bye.